When we usually speak or think about ancient Egypt, ancient Egyptian history, we are usually building our narration about the country from the perspective of its capitals like Memphis and Thebes. But we more seldom or rarely speak about provincial areas like Gebelein, and during my talk, I would like to focus on this point of view, history of ancient Egypt from a provincial perspective. During uh, this talk, I would like to focus on things that, you are, that are unique for Gebelein, uh, things that do not conform to canons or traditions or our view of ancient Egyptian culture, also things that are typical only for Gebelein. So I hope uh, this will be more interesting for you in a more broad context of uh, Egyptian civilization. When we are uh, building the narration or narrating the ancient Egyptian history from the perspective of its capitals, we are usually concerned with sources related to the highest echelons of the society, uh, people who are literate or uh, to whom the literate sources, textual sources were referring to, people who are subject of uh, the uh, iconographic depictions. And in a result, we know actually very little, uh, well, the large part of the population, which was illiterate, uh, which was not related to the capital, escapes us from uh, the view of ancient Egyptian civilization. Uh, so our sources are concerning only the one, two, maybe three percent of the pop entire population of the country of the pharaohs. And also this uh, upper class, upper stratum of the society constructed the narration and made the sources from which we are trying to reconstruct something like 90% of the population of the country. Of course, my research and talk today will is not aiming to change this optic and uh, this point of view. It's impossible at the, this state of the research, but uh, I just wanted to let you know uh, what is the um, how important it is to study provincial areas because they provide us more information about the lower uh, social groups in the society. Also, it is impossible to present history of Gebelein sufficiently through all periods of ancient Egyptian history. So I get to make uh, numerous uh, shortcuts, abbreviations, generalizations, and I would like to focus on four selected aspects of uh, Gebelein. First, I will speak about Gebelein during the state formation uh, in the fourth millennium BC. Then I would like to make a big jump and skip the old kingdom and go to the first intermediate period during which there was there were numerous Nubians in that area and we can uh, study ethnic diversity of this region. It's important to underline when that when we are speaking about different ethnic groups in Egypt, we are usually where well, we are tending to uh, divide them into Egyptians, Nubians, Libyans, basically Nubians, or basically Egyptians and non-Egyptians. But we are, I think, never speaking about people who has mixed origins, people who are kind of ambiguous, who do not have, who are, whose ethnicity is binary, uh, that can be mixed like Egyptian and Nubian. Then we will make, after this, we will make another big jump to the New Kingdom, where I'd like to focus on religion, uh, the local temple, and the religious landscape, as well as popular or vernacular uh, religious activities. And from there, we will make another much bigger jump to uh, Greek or Roman period, or actually to the Ptolemaic times. And this will conclude uh, the talk. So when we are speaking about provincials, provincial areas in Egypt, it is very often a case that very little was published about provincial sites, sites like Hosam or Er Rizekat. Like Er Rizekat is a very good example. It is a site, a cemetery located about 13 kilometers north of Gebelein, and it was researched by several scholars and none of them published 
a single report or a longer description of the site. While copy capital areas like Thebes, Memphis, Abydos, Recompolis are suffering from over extension of well, the overdose of publications uh, and they're uh, very well published sites. Well, maybe not in every aspect, but usually we have a uh, reasonably good knowledge about them. Gebelein is some, something in between uh, those two uh, ends of the spectrum. There are some publications, but they are usually not sufficient. If you're going to, uh, to research a provincial site, and you are not finding any good publications, uh, you are sooner or later coming across numerous unpublished uh, data, like unpublished field reports, drawing, accounts of travelers, images, and numerous artifacts uh, distributed among numerous museums around the world. Then if you will go to the site in the field, you can try to find traces of what was documented previously, find new things, and thanks to this, try to reconstruct the extent of the site, its structure, locations of individual uh, structures, archaeological features, and then try to reconstruct the history of the site. And this allows us to actually reconstruct the history, well, at least try to do the hypothetical reconstruction of the history of the local population. And this is my aim uh, for the research at Gebelein. I would like to make a comprehensive examination of all the well, comprehensive study study that will be featuring all the important uh, well, it will present all the evidence related to Gebelein that will allow us to reconstruct the local provincial history. Of course, I'm not the first scholar who is uh, conducting research related at, uh, with Gebelein. Uh, already some scholars and uh, some excellent scholars uh, published very good monographs about selected periods of the history of, the, of this region. Other scholars were focusing on specific uh, buildings or others uh, or different scholars were aiming at descript describing the area, but only from a perspective of one museum collection. In contrast to the previous studies, I'm aiming at gaining a broader view, comprehensive one from pre-dynastic times up to practically contemporary times. Archaeological sites at Gebelein are representing all periods of prehistory and history of uh, Egypt from Upper Paleolithic practically to the nowadays, including medieval times, 18th century, and of course, all periods of pharaonic history. So, Gebelein is located in southern Egypt, about 28 kilometers southwest of Luxor, on the west bank of the Nile. The Arabic name Al Gebelein uh, means two mountains, or rather two rocky mountains, which you can see here. In front, you can see the bigger western mountain, and further in, by the horizon, you can see the smaller eastern mountain of Gebelein. The bigger western mountain is bordering with the Sahara Desert, while the southern one is bordering with the Nile. The ancient Egyptian name of that area, Inerti, also meant two rocks. And let's see the general uh, appearance or uh, topography and distribution of the most important archaeological sites in that area. Starting from the north, there was the town of Sumenu, somewhere north from the western mountain of Gedelein. We do not know its exact location. The uh, location of the town was changing through pharaonic history. South from it, there was the northern necropolis, stretching along the foot and northern slope of the western mountain. South of it, there were numerous outcrops of chairs and limestone, uh, basically covering a large part of the western mountain. There is one cultic structure carved into the rock dating to the pharaonic times in the northern part of the western mountain, and its southern tip, there is a, a Coptic rock-cut chapel in the central area of Gebelein, there is the central necropolis, 
uh, covering large, like few hundred uh, meters from south of the mountain to its middle. Many tombs were later reused by Coptic monks, and the cemetery is uh, very much disturbed. East of it, there is the town. There was the town of Perhathor, which is also known under its Greek name Pathiris. There are, there are also some uh, cultic structures over there, like temple and rock cut chapel dedicated to Hathor. Then going south, there is the southern necropolis dating to the Late Old Kingdom and the first intermediate period, and west of it, a Muslim necropolis tentatively dated to Fatimid times. The history of research of that area is very long and complex. Already in 1884, local people started to conduct illegal digging and exploration and numerous artifacts ended up at the antiquities market. This provoked uh, Gaston Maspero to conduct first official archaeological exploration of the area and he was most probably, I'm 99% sure that he was digging the eastern part of the northern necropolis of Gebelain in 1890, sorry, 1885. Then numerous, well, and he uh, found large quantity of artifacts and tombs, but the report that he published is very generic. He also misinterpreted uh, the chronology of the site. Back then, in 1880s, the pre-dynastic period was not discovered yet, and he found numerous pre-dynastic uh, objects, which he dated to the times between the Late Old Kingdom and the Middle Kingdom, back then known as the times of Intefs, and we call uh, this period right now the First Intermediate Period. This provoked many confusions, la confusions later. For example, there is very well preserved pre-dynastic bed in the collection of uh, Boston Museum, which is dated as pre-dynastic and reused uh, during the Middle Kingdom because of the confusion uh, that was provoked by Maspero. Of course, each uh, scholar who was working at Gebelain is an individual story and I cannot uh, speak about each and uh, each of them, so I made small selection just to make a brief outline of the most important works. And I would like to focus on uh, the works which were happening in the very late 19th century and early 20th century because they are typical, well, very representative to what was happening at Gebelain. Uh, it is important to mention that Gebelain was famous exploration area for enthusiasts of antiquities uh, and antiquities dealers. It was located conveniently not far away from Luxor, about a few hours, uh, probably two hours by train or a few hours by boat. Uh, so it was easy to reach by antiquities dealers and it was a provincial area, lesser known, so not very carefully guarded. And many people were taking advantage of this. And, um, but we should remember that in the 19th century and early 20th century, according to Egyptian law, uh, it was possible for private individuals to conduct archaeological excavation if they will, pro if there will be, pro uh, if uh, some kind of a supervision from the antiquity service will be provided, and they will deliver or handle half of the artifacts found during exploration to the Cairo Museum. Of course, uh, the supervision of such uh, explorations was often poor and not all, uh, nece and, mm, not necessarily the half of the artifacts alleged for the museum uh, in Cairo went there. And of course, it was easier to plunder provincial sites. Uh, also, enthusiasts uh, of antiquities were not often, well, they were often not publishing the results and descriptions of their works, and it is often not possible to judge whether or not such explorations were legal or illegal. Good example is a Dutch scholar, Jan Insinger, uh, who, was who was frequently wintering in Luxor, and he was acquiring numerous artifacts from Gebelain. He was probably ordering local people to conduct some uh, excavations, but we are not sure whether or not they were legal. And many of the artifacts were sent later to the uh, State Museum 
uh, State Museum of Antiquities in Leiden at the beginning of the 20th century. But we know very little about the original context of these uh, artifacts, and you can see here small just a small selection of numerous artifacts provided to the museum by Insinger. Then Mikhail, Mikhail uh, from Koptos um, was spotted working there. Uh, it was actually Summers Clark who met them at Gebelein, and uh, Summers, Summers Clark in his report wrote that he accounted certain Mikhail from Koptos, uh, who was probably conducting some kind of illegal exploration. Also, some uh, officials like Arthur Weigel, uh, he was sur surveying southern Egypt at the beginning of 20th century. He conducted a survey in Moala, which is located about uh, six kilometers south from Gebelein, and he published the results of the survey at Moala, uh, but he never mentioned that he was working at Gebelein. He only mentioned that he did venture it to surrounding archaeological sites. What is interesting, he brought to the Cairo Museum several artifacts, which he specifically described as coming from Gebelein, so he also extended his survey to Gebelein, or at least collected some very nice artifacts. Very interesting person is Robert de Rustafiagel. I hope I'm pronouncing the family name correctly. This is not his original name. Uh, he used that name um, semi-officially. Uh, he was actually an Englishman as far as I know, and he was traveling around, around the world and he was collecting antiquities. He was a businessman, entrepreneur, and he established a trading company in Luxor in 1906. And we know from his private letters that he was uh, visiting numerous archaeological sites, including Gebelein, where he collected numerous uh, artifacts, which later were sold to numerous collections around the world, and some of, or some of them were donated to other collections. I think that he was making this collection of antiquities and then uh, redistributing the antiquities for free to various institutions to gain access to different educated and well-off societies in Europe. Why I think so? Because he was very often upgrading the visual aspects of the antiquities that he was collecting. Here you can see early dynastic jars that are painted with a kind of an imitation of dewar dating to pre-dynastic time. Uh, and this is a forgery. He probably, well, he had a quite a substantial knowledge about pre and early dynastic art. So he chose early artifacts to embellish them, to make them more appealing for museums. And then he donated these objects to various museums in like Oslo, Vienna or Saint Germain en Laye. Well, it is a very curious uh, thing and uh, it's the not um, many other people were doing similar things. But enough of, let's finish the history of the research because there is much more to say about Gebelein. Uh, it's enough to say that artifacts from Gebelein are distributed among really numerous museum collections around the world. Uh, I am conducting archival surveys to find unpublished uh, field reports, collect images, drawings of that area, uh, to compare them later with the current appearance of that uh, region in order to reconstruct who and where was working at Gebelein. Archival maps are very helpful because they are providing us with the description of pre-industrial landscape and extension or natural extension of the inundation area of the Nile. This is crucial because early uh, explorers were usually when they were describing where archaeological site is located, they were usually referring to the border of agricultural area, uh, uh, waterways, uh, train stations, other things that they thought will be permanent. Well, this is not the case. The introduction of uh, mechanic, well, uh, benzene engines and water pumps allowed to expand the agricultural area in the valley of the Nile. Very useful is the 1940s 
map of Sar general survey of Egypt maps uh, because they are uh, very well describing locations of channels, canals, uh, train station, rail railways, uh, which were often uh, reference points where people were describing locations of their excavations. Julia Hilla made very useful and excellent georeferences of archival and archival maps and contemporary satellite images so we can locate the different uh, features of the landscape uh, in past and uh, in contemporary times and compare them. As a result of this uh, study that is combining archival uh, survey as well as field survey, it was possible to reconstruct who was working where and in which year. And here you have um, a map presenting dates and dates are placed in the place places where which were excavated in certain year. Also, uh, I took a look at um, entry journals of numerous museums and when uh, artifacts were published or appearing in the antiquity market and the dates which you can see here are representing the dates where certain objects artifacts were published or entered collections and uh, and here we can see number of artifacts and you can see uh, the history of the exploration through artifacts and their appearance on uh, on the market, let's say. And we can see that first official excavate, excavations uh, had very good harvest of about 40 artifacts. And first Italian excavation of the Egyptian Museum in Turin uh, and reached uh, the Turin Museum and the Cairo Museum with 80 artifacts. But there are some years uh, like 1901 when we have no documents uh, describing any archaeological work, but numerous artifacts entered the various museum collections. This means that in that year, somebody was probably illegally uh, exploring the area and selling the artifacts. Also, uh, after each uh, research season at Gebelein, or in general, in area, any area of the world, local people were coming to the explored site and were further finishing off the site to uh, find more antiquities that can be sold, and this explains uh, kind of an aftermatch of a uh, number of antiquities that were appearing in, for example, in 1885 numerous antiquities were found and donated to various museums, but then in few years more or smaller number of antiquities was appearing on the market and they probably came from the same area as those from 1885. When I started my work at the Gable Lane in 2013, what I knew about it, it was its location, uh, that there was a western and eastern mountain. There is a gener very generic plan published in 2000, but it's really generic, very small, and further research proved that it contains some errors. Also, I knew that numerous artifacts came from that area, especially through dynastic ones, and this brought my attention. And uh, that's why that area became the subject of my PhD dissertation. So uh, we started to conduct a uh, field survey, uh, conducting uh, the survey with traditional paper documentation. It's difficult, so our excellent uh, GIS specialist Julia Hela uh, conducted uh, the documentation from the survey in uh, geographic information system. We carefully uh, described locations of each archaeological feature and also locations of, of all the artifacts that we collected along the way and we can uh, trace their location on maps. We also made, uh, well actually Jakub Ordutowski made uh, geophysical prospection of the area, uh, revealing uh, numerous previously unknown geophysical anomalies. Uh, we Yulia later made a georeference of archival plans, maps, uh, maps made by uh, geophysical survey. We compared uh, the current landscape and locations of previous excavations uh, with the current state of the preservation of the area. We looked for 
archaeological features which were uh, which are visible on our cabal images and we are trying to find them in the field it was sometimes possible and in effect like on the example of the eastern part of the northern necropolis uh, it was possible to locate numerous archaeological features establish which of them were already explored uh, and through the documentation that we gathered uh, we proposed hypothetical reconstruction of the panorama and history of this part of the cemetery also in a broader sense it was possible to reconstruct the history of whole uh, area of Gebelein. when i'm saying Gebelein, i'm referring to the area of the two mountains but we should remember that Gebelein is not a single archaeological site it is a group of numerous archaeological sites from various period uh, which had different functions and also sometimes using the term the Gebelein region which is stretching around uh, Gebelein itself anyway uh, thanks to the surveys and uh, Inquiries in museums, it was possible to gather numerous artifacts ref either referring to Gebelein, like this uh, vase uh, dating to the first uh, dynasty, times of the first dynasty, which was found in Saqqara and is mentioning the name of the town of Sumenu, which was located here. It was possible to establish where numerous artifacts were more or less found, like, for example, these ones from the museum in Lyon, which were excavated during French uh, exploration of the area in 1907 and 8, somewhere over here. So sometimes possible to establish more or less the locations of the of other finds like the Gebelein Man, which was found in the central necropolis, and tentatively provide uh, interpretation, well, uh, suggest the fine spot of the Gebelein Linen, which was found somewhere in the central part of the northern necropolis of Gebelein. And now we can uh, easily go to the fourth millennium, the first aspect of the history of Gebelein. And at this moment, I need to really speed up my presentation because I just realized that I was speaking already far too long about uh, the history of the research of that area. I apologize for that. Anyway, uh, during the early part of the pre-dynastic period, there were numerous important centers of the early statehood in Egypt in the southern part of Upper Egypt. But by the middle of pre-dynastic uh, period, only, uh, well, many of them lost their independence, let's say. And the most important uh, centers were Thys Abydos, Nagada and Hierakonpolis. Later, the dynasty coming from Thebes, from Thes and buried at Abydos, extended its power to other areas of Egypt and united the country. And the historiography of uh, of uh, pre-dynastic or early Egypt is dominated by those three important centers. Of course, they were very important, but they are considered as pre-dynastic capitals of proto-states partly because they were very well, the results of the excavations were very well published, in contrast to other provincial sites. Like you can see an example of publication from Hurricane Police, where sufficient plans, drawings, and images of artifacts were published, but in the case of Gebelein and other provincial sites, this was not the case. Already numerous scholars who were very good experts uh, expressed their thoughts that Gebelein was very important, one of the key sites to understand early history of Egypt. It is important to mention that Ernesto Schiaparelli wrote that Gebelein was actually the first site where, actually first large site, uh, which provided numerous pre-dynastic artifacts. And also uh, Georges Darcy expressly said that Gebelein should be counted among the most important sites, but unfortunately previous scholars were not publishing uh, the results of their, uh, their work in a sufficient extent to verify this. So scholars before were usually know new Gebelein only through artifacts. Also the general public knows about Gebelein through other artifacts. You don't need to, I don't need to um, introduce the Gebelein man. And my PhD dissertation focused on uh, actually trying to check whether or not we can count Gebelein among the pre-dynastic uh, capitals. 
Well, if we look at Gebelein from a broader perspective, this is a it is a biggest concentration of large uh, opulent archaeological sites, which do not have equals in the radius of about 30 kilometers around. Also, the uh, settlement structure uh, of that area is typical for uh, important centers. And in the northern part of the Gebelein region, somewhere north of Armand, these two cartouches were found dating to late pre-dynastic period or early early dynastic period, uh, which are mentioning nowhere a tasted local ruler. Maybe you can speculate that maybe this person was ruling from Gebelein. Also, numerous very opulent, unique artifacts came from that area, proving the wealth of the local elite. And this wealth probably came from its involvement in the local politics. It's worth to mention this two objects uh, published recently by Stan Hendricks. The figurine on the left, which you can see here, is wearing probably the first uh, attestation of a crown of Upper Egypt. Uh, probably the white figurine, the bigger one, uh, had similar uh, head covering, uh, and such figurines are only found uh, were only found at Abydos and Nagada and Gebelein. Uh, and when, if we will accept that Gebelein was one of the capitals of early Egypt, we will see that uh, the sites which were important centers, political centers, are located in equidistant locations. Every each 50 kilometers, there is a site that was most probably capital of uh, proto-state. Is it accidental? Well, I don't think so. Uh, what can it mean? If we'll approach this from the perspective of Kristaller's central place theory, uh, we can suspect that Mm, those early centers originated from commerce and trade and uh, good, well, good manufacturing centers and trade points that later developed uh, political functions and then became uh, political capitals in time, of course. And now we need to uh, go to the next uh, stop in our journey for the history of Gebelein, the first intermediate period and the ethnic composition of the local population. Nubians were always pre present in uh, southern Egypt. There was no clear border between Sudan, uh, well, ethnic border, no clear ethnic border between Nubia and Egypt. People were traveling, going up and down the Nile, and Nubians were <coughs> settled in uh, southern Egypt for generations. We cannot call them foreigners. They were born there, raised there, they have family there, they were mixing with the local population. However, when we, looking, when we are looking at presence of Nubians uh, in, in Egypt, we're usually looking at them from ancient Egyptian perspective because they were often uh, depicted in tombs or, uh, or as this case, they were subject of models uh, made during the first intermediate period. I would like to bring your attention to those colorful sashes that they are wearing and uh, short kilts. Uh, they are very often uh, depicted in various ways with different patterns. This may signalize something that that they are not only the generic ethnic marker of Nubian, but also different patterns may refer to different ethnic groups or tribal groups within uh, the broader uh, group of Nubians. They were not a monolithic group, Probably they were divided into smaller groups we have, which had the various uh, affiliate relations with Egyptian state and Egyptian uh, population. There are at least four uh, pots that can be related to Nubians and coming uh, from Gebelein, but there is about 30 still dating to the late old kingdom and the early and the first intermediate period and 15 well about 10 of them are showing nubians uh which is surprising uh, this is surprising because there is more still showing nubians like this ones over here then there is pots this is a very good example of the saying that pots are not people if those still would not survive 
we will probably will be not, not aware that Nubians were present in this region. Sabina Kubic, who uh, was studying steely coming from Gebelin region, observed that, that we can distinguish two workshops uh, which were producing uh, these objects. The first workshop was carefully following the Old Kingdom tradition, while the second workshop was more, let's say, novel, more unique, more typical for this region. And Nubians are almost exclusively depicted with their ethnic markers on this stele. What is interesting, well, stele are usually um, also um, their high, so uh, high social uh, status markers. Not everybody, not everyone could afford to have a decorated and inscribed stela. Therefore, we can assume that stele are representing local elite. And since at least 10 stele are representing Nubians, uh, we can assume that about one third of the local elite had were Nubians. Also, stele uh, can express, in my opinion, stele are expressing what we want to say to the world about ourselves. You know, of course, in, uh, in the context of the deceased. Stilly were designed to be exhibited uh, in the accessible, par accessible parts of the tomb. They were mass manifestation of wealth, uh, social position, uh, etc. Everything that person or his family or people who ordered such object wanted to say about the deceased. Uh, however, things which were stored in the burial chamber, which was not accessible, uh, well, these objects were expressing more intimate and private aspects of a person. And bearing this in mind, I would like to speak today about two tombs uh, which are located in the northern necropolis of Gebelein. First, it is the tomb of Inyi, located in the northern part of the eastern section of the cemetery. And the second one uh, is the tomb of General Iti, the second located in the central part of the eastern limit of that cemetery. The tomb of Inu was ex discovered and excavated by Virginia Rosa in 1911. We do not know the exact location of the tomb, but thanks to the very good description uh, provided by Rosa, it, it is possible to reconstruct the appearance uh, of the tomb, at least the hypothetical uh, reconstruction of the form of the tomb, because Rosa provided measurements and locations of uh, rooms, corridors and artifacts which were found in the burial chamber. And we can actually very well say where each item was uh, set in the burial chamber. I'm currently working with Jakub Stempnik uh, on a reconstruction, 3D reconstruction of uh, that tomb. Of course, this is a very preliminary, very tentative reconstruction, which only allow us to um, have very generic idea about this tomb. The tomb was consisting of two rooms. So from the entrance, you were entering to a room with a pillar in its more or less middle. Then on the right hand side, there was a, a shaft leading through a corridor, descending corridor to the burial chamber. The burial chamber is very interesting because it is featuring two burial customs. Already Anna Maria Donadoni Roveri, uh, observed that two burial customs were featured in this uh, tomb. In the southern part of the burial chamber, there was the coffin of Inyi. Uh, he was mummified, placed in typical first intermediate coffin and surrounded by typical Egyptian items like pottery and funerary models, models of um, grain containers. And in the northern part, sorry, uh, eastern part of the burial chamber, there was a skin of a cow and on the neck of that uh, cow hide was placed a uh, figurine, uh, actually a sculpture, wooden sculpture, ka sculpture of Inyi, which, about which we'll uh, speak in a moment. Also other models were found there like this one. What is interesting and unique about this model is that we can see here four men. We can see that there are men because they're wearing similar uh, kills. However, Three of them are, they have yellow complexion, which is 
typical marker of female gender, and one of them has dark red complexion, which is typical for depictions of men. Is this a depiction of um, not gender, not binary persons? Maybe not. Maybe this is a reference to their ethnicity, because in ancient Egyptian art, uh, dark complexion was usually referring to people, uh, to Nubians and Libyans, a red complexion to Egyptian men and yellow uh, skin to Egyptian women. But in this case, uh, these two colors, red and uh, yellow, were used to mark uh, Nubians and Egyptians working together. And we will speak about this a little bit later. In this, uh, this figurine or statue was found uh, on the cow height uh, near the coffin of Inyi. And on the left, we can see how it is uh, preserved today. A rather usual uh, object. However, if we look on the right on the image, how this figurine was found. This photo was made at Gebelein uh, during the excavations, and we can see that the upper part of body of uh, Inyi is completely black, while the feet are reddish or brownish. Nevertheless, of the original uh, name of the color, we can see that the black paint uh, was applied very carefully. So we can see the sclerae, the white parts of the eyes, not covered by this paint. Also, there is no black stains on the uh, kilt, uh, legs and uh, pedestal of the figurine. So application of this black paint was uh, not accidental. Uh, at some stage, probably during conservation, the black color was removed. Uh, unfortunately, there is no record informing us about any conservation, uh, any removal of this black substance from the statue. However, some black stains still survived on the left arm of Inyi. And this use of the colors is, in my opinion, not accidental. Probably, uh, Ini wanted to express uh, through furnishing of his tomb that he had kind of a double or mixed ethnicity. The use of the cowhide in such a way in his burial chamber may signify that he had some Nubian or Kerman ancestry because in Kerma culture and Nubian culture, the cysts were placed in burial pits on uh, skins of cattle and also they were, could have been covered by cattle skin um, and this was may have been a reference to such a burial custom according to Anna Maria Donado Niroveri while such unusual painting of this uh, cast statue was also a reference he wanted to say that he had both ethnicities. The black uh, color was symbolizing his southern ethnicity, the red one that he also had Egyptian affiliation. Actually, the name Ini is interesting because it's appearing on several artifacts coming from Gebelein. This is the famous stela of Hekaib and Senet. As you can see, the stella was violated in a very characteristic manner, so the faces were smashed and limbs were kind of cut, uh, cut off from the main body. The autobiography or self-presentation of Hekaib is mentioning that actually this whole artifact was made by his son, Ini. Ini is mentioned in the uh, inscription here. And it would be, uh, we, can ex we should expect that Ini would be depicted uh, in the stella here. However, the hieroglyphic inscription accompanying uh, Ini, uh, that person says that this is Iker, which is actually strange. We should expect that uh, son of uh, Hekaib, Ini, will be represented here. This is not the case, or maybe uh, Ini is referred in the text as Ini, but in the depiction, is the same per this is the same person, but under his second name or a nickname or something like that, because uh, the word Iker means something like excellent or virtuous. And, and bear this in mind, because now we will go to the tomb of General E.T. II, who was an army commander in the region. How do we know that uh, this tomb, which was excavated by Rosa in 1911 and dating to the first intermediate period, belonged to 
E.T. and his wife, Neferu. First, uh, this wall painting was found in the southern part of a pillared hall, and its western part was the damage to uh, accommodate this stila. This stila is not an original part of the decoration of the tomb. It was actually donated to the owner of the tomb by his brother, whom we can see here. And the inscription says that it was made for uh, E.T. and his wife by his brother. However, if we'll take a look at the burial chamber, this coffin was detected in the burial chamber, and this coffin is containing the body of Ini Iker. We can speculate whether or not this is actually, this coffin is depiction of a relative or deceased member of the family. I didn't find any analogy for that so far. So if you could, uh, if you have any idea how to interpret this, please let me know. Also, in the same tomb, this Another stila was found depicting four soldiers about whom I will speak in a moment. But let's take a look at the stela of Iti and Neferu. As in the case of the previous stila of Hekaib and Senet, the value the stela was destroyed in a similar way. So the faces were smashed, limbs were cut off, even the dogs were partly damaged, as you can see, and other persons. This stila, uh, the stila of Senet, Hekaib and Senet, and one more stila not coming from Gembelein uh, were violated in exactly the same manner. The third stila belonged to, to E.T. of Yumiteru. We do not know where exactly E.T. of Yumiteru was buried, but he was buried either at Gembelein or at Rizeikat. I think that probably the stila of, of E.T. of Yumiteru actually originally came from the tomb of E.T. II, and it was his Stila. Although this is a preliminary idea, I'm still working on this. Uh, the Stila of E.T. of Umiter from Umiter was very poorly published. I'm going to see it during my visit to the um, Museum of Egyptian Civilization soon. Anyway, it's also interesting how the body colors were represented. We can see that brother of uh, E.T. II has a dark red complexion, while uh, E.T. and his wife has kind of fairly white or bright skin or the paint didn't survive. It's hard to say, is it the result of preservation or it was a deliberate thing? It may have been deliberate thing if we will take a look at other stili, but this in a moment. Uh, there is, as I said, um, about 30 stili coming from Gable Lane. It is possible to make a tentative or hypothetical reconstruction of genealogy of some of the people represented on this stele, uh, because the names are written in various texts. So, for example, this Stella from Berlin uh, belonged to the soldier named Kedes. His mother was Ibeb, and his father was E.T. Kedes has his uh, son also named E.T. It's possible, it's only speculation, but this E.T., son of Kedes, is our general E.T. II, who was married to Neferu. We know nothing about their uh, offspring. The name Ibeb doesn't sound really Egyptian. It sounds more Nubian, and maybe uh, the, um, this whole play with the skin colors may be a reference to a double or mixed ethnicity of this family. Um, also, uh, they may have been relatives of Ini Iker, and uh, therefore uh, we can see that the local elite was of mixed ethnicity. And we, when we will take a closer look at the stila about which I was saying before, uh, that is the stila uh, found in the tomb of in the tomb of Iti II, we can see that there are four men. They are wearing typical men garments uh, holding bows and arrows but they have different skin uh, complexions. Uh, as I said, the yellow skin was typical for men, or, red for, or dark red for, uh, sorry, yellow for women, uh, red and dark red for Egyptians and Nubi uh, men and Nubians respectively. In this, uh, in this case, uh, the use of the skin tones may refer to mixed ethnicity of this group, 
Also, we should remember that names within a family were sometimes uh, inherited in every second generation. And one of the men present, represented here has a name which we can translate in various ways, like Teti Ini, Ini Teti, or Ini Iti. Well, it's really difficult to guess what was the original uh, uh, order of the signs. And if you will look even closer to these two uh, elements, lower parts of their kilts, we can see typical uh, for sashes, typical Nubian sashes with those kind of tassels uh, in the lower part, uh, which may be a reference to typical Egyptian uh, ethnic marker. So this stila is concluding our discussion about uh, ethnic composition of the local population, which was consisting of many Nubians and Egyptians. And it's worth to underline that there was there were plenty of people of mixed origin and Nubians were important part of the local elite governing that micro region and region. And now we are going to the end of the presentation. So the religious landscape of that area, mainly the, during the uh, New Kingdom. When we are speaking about ancient Egyptian religion, we should remember that we know it mainly from the state temples, uh, opulent royal tombs and decoration of provincial temples as well. Uh, this is referring to state official cult, not to the popular or uh, vernacular religion, which is very poorly known in case of ancient Egypt. Also, we should remember that an access to temples in Egypt for was till the times of till the times of the 19th dynasty restricted only for the elite and people who were directly involved uh, to their uh, religious cult. Ordinarily, people usually do not have access to the temple itself. However, they could have an access to um, sanctity to the divine images to the the divine sphere only during annual procession of barks that were carrying depictions of gods during an annual procession and navigation along the Nile. Uh, landscape is more egalitarian because landscape was used uh, for religious practices like processions, uh, burials, uh, and more people had access to what was happening beyond temples. Of course, in the capital areas like Thebes, uh, it is easier to reconstruct the cultic landscape and conceptualization of various elements of the religious landscape, like the El Khurn mountain, uh, which is dominating the landscape of Thebes and which is resembling the shape. Well, its shape resembles uh, a pyramid and it can be inter interpreted as a kind of a natural pyramid. Something similar is a taste at the Gibelane at the central. Side. There are two uh, natural rocks, which shape is naturally resembling pyramids, when, especially when one is looking from a temple or a cemetery and exactly in front of those two, uh, those natural pyramids, tombs were located more or less exactly on the axis of the supposed natural pyramid. When, uh, but I would like to focus more on uh, local temple and religious cult uh, instead of the uh, reference to the deceased individuals in this region, the eastern mountain of Gedelein. In its northern part, over here, there was the town of Perhato, later known as Patiris in Ptolemaic times. Here we can see a kind of a grayish brown spot. These are bricks which are remains of the one of the district of the districts of the town. And on the top of the mountain, somewhere over here, there was the temple dedicated to Hathor and possibly some other deities. And we'll discuss this in a moment. Not too much survived from this temple. Only some concentrations of bricks here in the town area 
and over here this uh, pile of buried uh, is uh, one of the very few remains of the Temenos wall which was originally surrounding the um, uh, temple complex. From the temple practically survived nowadays only this two huge uh, granite blocks with those circular shapes inside. Uh, according to David Torek, these are uh, stands for flagpoles, which were flanking an entrance to the local temple. If uh, these blocks are in their original location, we're not sure about this, uh, they are marking the location of the entrance to the temple and orientation of the axis of the temple. It is interesting that the entrance to this temple was from the west, not from the east as it was usual. Also, the Nile is on the east, which is even more unusual. This was probably due to the shape of the rock because the only access to the temple can be uh, gained through this path going through from west to east. Mm -hmm. um, the history of the temple is uh, quite long. The earliest artifacts related with religious cult uh, from here are dating to early dynastic period, like uh, this uh, first or second dynasty uh, stila, probably uh, showing temple foundation ritual. Some uh, depictions, well, statues, statuettes of lions were found at Gebelein. However, we do not know where exactly they were found, whether or not they are coming from tombs, or from temples, that, that is still a, a question for further research. This is quite interesting. Uh, this so-called nodding falcon is allegedly coming from Gebelein. The image which you can see here is clear. It's deliberately made in such a way because uh, this statuette is nodding, uh, rocking up and down, uh, front to back. Uh, it was deliberately designed in such a way. According to Elise Baumgartel, uh, this statue was related to, this was kind of an oracle that probably there was some cunning or sneaky contraption behind uh, it or under it. And uh, so when a person was approaching this and had a question to ask to the divinity that was represented by this uh, figurine, a priest or somebody else could discreetly make it move in response to the question uh, asked by uh, the visitor, which is quite unique, uh, unique uh, regarding that this statue is dated to the early dynastic period. But these artifacts are not informing us who or which, what kind of god, deity or god was worshipped in the temple area in such an early time. It's usually assumed that Hathor Lady of Tender was worshipped uh, there. However, our current research provides more evidence about the early cult of Hathor. Uh, during our current surveys, we found such small uh, clay impressions, well, impressions of seals made in clay, and one of them is showing name of Hathor. Another uh, seal was found by the Italian mission in the 1920s or 30s. Um, and is dated to the times of the fifth dynasty. It's also mentioning uh, the name of Hathor. And very interesting is this stone container dating to the times of Pepi the first. The inscription is very peculiar. Well, the whole container is allegedly coming from Gebelein, and the inscription says, the king of Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, Pepi the first, beloved of Hathor, lady of Dendera. This is interesting. Why Lady of Dendera uh, at the Gebel Lane? If you will jump a few hundred years to the times of the late first intermediate period and early old kingdom, well, along the way, I need to uh, mention that uh, Hathor uh, is mentioned uh, in other sources like. Period. Uh, Wojtek, uh, we have some problems with hearing you. Nevertheless, we have some problems with hearing you. Ah, what's the problem? Can you be more you're specific? Break. You're, you're breaking, breaking, but now it's okay. So continue, please. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, anyway. Um, 
Mentu Hotep II constructed a chapel or a temple, small temple uh, made of limestone uh, on the top of the eastern mountain of Gebelein. And this temple was uh, dedicated to Hatter Lady of Dendera, and another attestation of Lady of Dendera at Gebelein. Why not Lady of Gebelein, which is also attested in later periods of local history? Well, further evidence may elucidate this question, but still let's uh, follow the history of the temple a little bit more. Uh, numerous other rulers were making the donations and extending the local temple, including uh, Hyksos kings. Uh, to briefly sum up the history and royal patronage of the temple, we can, uh, you can see uh, this very short list of kings who are making whose names are attested uh, in in the temple some of them are prolific builders known from practically every temple in Egypt like Mentuhotep the second or Ramses the second who are active practically everywhere more interesting are the kings of the second intermediate period whose names are <clears throat> less frequently attested they are very appearing very frequently here, uh, which can mean that they had very specific, well, the cult, local temple war was important for them. Maybe this was important cultic center during the second intermediate period, or maybe the area held some uh, strategic or economic or political significance. We do not know that this is the subject for further research. But let's focus on private individuals uh, who are active in the same area. Numerous people were donating various objects like Lady Tamit, uh, who donated this uh, beautiful uh, Hattoric bowl to Hattor, Lady of Gebelein. Numerous, about 80 uh, faience figurines were found in the temple precinct uh, during Italian excavations uh, in 1910. Uh, All of those figurines were uh, fractured well they were broken more or less in the middle similar figurines also broken in the middle also dated to more or less new kingdom were found in the mud precinct uh, in karnak we still do not know what was the significance of this what what what, what, what is the meaning of such an action and what with what kind of ritual activity this was located this is another question which we should address while researching this area also, there are numerous things which were found during uh, various uh, campaigns at Gedelein. Uh, some of them are, most of them are very typical provincial, representing a king making an offering to Hathor, Lady of Gedelein. However, this one is more interesting. I'm not a good expert in uh, New Kingdom art and stili especially, uh, but I do not see here any traces of uh, post-Amarna art no indicators that this stila was made after the times of Achetaton. Why this is the dating is so so important here? Because we can see here two ladies, two private individuals making a libation in front of the depiction of Hathor, Lady of Geb, probably Lady of Gebelein, uh, and this is it is very unique. Probably the only well, I do not know any other case where private individuals especially in provincial area, are doing uh, libation or are in the direct contact with a divinity before the 19th dynasty. If you know anything similar, please let me know, because uh, maybe because this was, Gebelein was a provincial area, local population was feeling more free to depict themselves with uh, direct contact with uh, divinities, which is not attested in capitals. Not only Hathor was worshipped at Gebelein, uh, especially in the uh, Temenos, which we are speaking about, also um, um, Upuawat is mentioned and uh, Anubis. The temple was probably extended or something was happening there during the times of the 21st dynasty. There is a concentration of bricks with stamps of Menhepera, who was high priest of Amun, during the 21st dynasty. 
And during the survey, we accounted uh, such bricks in the temple area as well as in the town itself. Probably that the bricks fell down from the temple or were reused for the town for the construction of the town. Uh, we also examined the local landscape and how it changed. We know that in the early 19th century, uh, the eastern face of the eastern mountain of Gebelein was subject of rock extraction and the limestone was quarried. And during our survey, we found uh, remains and traces of rock extraction. And we are using those old depictions to reconstruct not only the appearance of uh, the Eastern mountain, but also to reconstruct the religious landscape and the, where the religious procession uh, could have took place and which uh, routes they took. Uh, around the temple. I would like to thank here Marta Katanovic for finding and letting me know about this sketch made by Norman de Garis uh, Davies. This sketch uh, is showing the extent of the Temenos wall surrounding the temple area. Inside of it, there are two, uh, these two objects. These are the granite blocks which I showed you earlier during the talk and therefore we know the location and more or less the extent of the Temenos wall and we can compare the, this sketch with the current satellite view of the area and find the remains of the Temenos wall here and here. So we can uh, try to reconstruct its shape. Also, many scholars were visiting the site, for example, Helen and Jean Zaket uh, in 1960s, and they documented now lost uh, stone blocks and steely, which were still in the 1960s, lying here and there in the temple area. Also in the Turin archive, there is uh, this uh, notebook with sketches from excavations probably made in 1910 or 11 documenting the town and possibly the temple area as well and on the basis of all this evidence i'm trying to reconstruct the extent of the temenos uh, wall and locations of temples elisa fiore marocchetti uh, reconstructed the dimensions and shape of the mentuhotep's chapel together it was a very small structure as you can see here, it's the green object here. And there's a lot of space for other structures around. Uh, the granite blocks I mentioned earlier are located here in front of that edifice. Also, the mud bricks with inscriptions uh, with the stamps of Manhepera were found only in the northern part uh, of the Temenos, uh, forming a small uh, structure. Uh, and we never found uh, this um, uh, inscribed bricks within the walls of the Temenos wall. Therefore, we can suspect that this Temenos wall was not constructed by Menhepera, as is uh, suggested by some scholars. Going beyond the temple, we should also mention, I should also mention the epigraphical survey conducted by David Wieczorek, who uh, discovered and accounted numerous uh, rock inscriptions uh, below the temple on this rock shelf. So far, uh, they're located, they were found here. It's worth to observe that there are numerous niches along the way leading to the concentration of the inscriptions. According to Wieczorek, uh, these niches were originally made to accommodate stili, uh, and therefore the inscriptions uh, which were uh, carved here may be considered as uh, substitutes for stili made by people who couldn't, couldn't afford to make stili. The question is now, and of course, um, David accounted more than 30 inscriptions divided into five panels. They are dated to the late Middle Kingdom and early New Kingdom. Uh, According to Vyachorek, these are the oldest known ancient Egyptian prayers known from a temple area. Such an exemplary uh, example of uh, prayer is uh, this one, the divine adoration of Hathor Lady of Gebelein by the temple's scribe Senebu. And these inscriptions are also mentioning other di divinities like uh, Sobek, and Anubis, and they are made by various priests and uh, local individual, private individuals. Uh, according to Vietorek, uh, well, the question is why those inscriptions were made here. 
where if you will look uh, at, in the eastern direction, we can see magnificent, splendid view of the Nile. And we should remember that every year there was an uh, annual procession of bars and boats going from uh, Dendera to Edfu and carrying the depiction of the goddess Hathor from Dendera to Edfu. And uh, most probably uh, this procession was stopping by Edgedalain and visiting the local temple, a local shrine, maybe even a local cemetery. And this rock shelf was the perfect observation spot from which one could uh, spectate the whole event. And that is why local people were making the inscription to immortalize themselves, to show their piety to the goddess, uh, to show that they were present during this annual procession. So here you can see the view of the eastern mountain from the Nile, the rock uh, shelf, and below it, exactly 30 meters below it, there is this rock cut chapel, recently published by uh, Daniel Tokac in his monograph. Uh, Mm, the chapel is dating to the reign of Queen. At least its decoration is dated to the reign of, of Queen Hatshepsut. And possibly it was designed to accommodate some rituals related with this annual uh, visits of Hathor Lady of Dendera, who was visiting, let's say, her alter ego, Hathor Lady of Gebelain, because this kiosk is dedicated to Hathor Lady of Gebelain. Uh, I would like to thank here Piotr uh, Witkowski for his efforts and great work with documentation and making 3D models of uh, this temple and also uh, Vincent Uters for his help in excavations and Julia Hilla as well. Um, I strongly recommend you to read the monograph uh, by Daniel Tokac. Anyway, this is my reconstruction how the local how this area may have looked during the times of the New Kingdom or Greek or Roman times. So here's the rock shelf with the inscriptions, below with the entrance to the rock at chapel with uh, some kind of a quay or some structure enabling to enter the pressing. And then a road going here around the rock and then ascending to the temple and town. Along the way, by the beginning of this ascending road, there was a probably bark chapel. Why? I will explain this in a moment. Uh, so this is how the area looked from a satellite. So here is the chapel. And the procession was probably reaching the uh, Hatter Lady of Gebelin Chapel here, then going north, turning east, uh, sorry, west, then a south, and going through this road to the entrance of the temple. The, uh, why do, why I'm suggesting that the procession was going through this road? Uh, numerous uh, Demotic and Greek texts are mentioning existence of a road in the northern part of Gebel, of the town of Patris, uh, the, which name was Dromos. Dromos was usually used to describe a pathway or a road leading to a temple or in front of a temple. In demotic sources, uh, the, this Dromos is called the road of the go of the gods, which is revealing the purpose of uh, this communication line. Then some rituals were happening in the within the Temenos, and then the statue was probably carried down the slope through this road going west and then to the necropolis and we can make this tentative or hypothetical reconstruction of the local pathway um, from the Nile to the temple through the town possibly to this concentration of rock uh, carvings graffiti inscriptions which are may uh, referring mentioning some divinities and also uh, and also this spot is exactly in front of the entrance to the temple, and the temple is on the axis of this concentration of graffiti. It's possible that the we can speculate that then the procession was going north through the cemetery and then going back in the direction of the Nile. The time is uh, getting short. I'm already speaking too long, so I very briefly now will jump to the late, very late history of the area. We know practically nothing about Gebelain during late period. There are no 
almost no sources. Well, there is this figurine tentatively dated to the late period. We are not sure where it was found. Uh, it is in the Ashmolean Museum right now. It was acquired in uh, second half of the 19th century. And there is this papyrus, uh, with the book of the dead, dating either to the late period or early Ptolemaic times. There is no other evidence from the area dated to the late period. However, there is an indirect reference to Gebelein. The local topo uh, toponyms are changing their uh, spelling. Usually the name Gebelein was uh, the name of Pateris uh, or Perhathor was spelled in that way during pharaonic times. So Perhathor with the determinative uh, showing the sign representing a settlement, which means the settlement of Perhathor. However, the great donation text carved on the Ptolemaic, uh, Ptolemaic uh, temple in Edfu, but comp compiled from earlier texts from the late period, the determinative is Iset, which is a determinative saying, meaning place. So get Perhathor place not a settlement, and this can in indicate that the settlement was not in use, it was not inhabited, but still the, there was a, this place was known, it was only a toponym, possibly only the temple was functioning. Uh, and then in about 184 BC, uh, the revolt in Upper Egypt, uh, which was against the Ptolemaic uh, government, was uh, defeated and uh, New uh, capital, uh, well, capital of a new nome was established at Gebelein in the town of Perhator, which was which is known from Greek sources as Pathiris. More than 1,400 uh, Greek and Demotic documents are uh, coming from that town or are related to that town. Numerous scholars were trying to reconstruct the topography of that area during uh, Ptolemaic times. However, they lacked uh, sufficient data from the uh, related to the topography. Giovanni Bergamini uh, reconstructed uh, generic proposed generic reconstruction of the plan plan of one of the districts of the town on the basis of the documentation made by Italian excavations uh, in the beginning at the beginning of the 20th century. However, this requires some adjustments. Currently, Aneta Scarlett is studying the Ptolemaic topography of the Ptolemaic town, and she came across this very interesting and peculiar papyrus coming from Gebelein and now preserved in the Cairo Museum. This papyrus is Ptolemaic period plan of one some part of Gebelein. A temple is, the, uh, is depicted on several fragments of uh, the papyrus. Uh, agricultural fields are uh, also included, waterways, but, but uh, this papyrus is very poorly preserved and uh, Aneta Scalet is trying to reconstruct, uh, well, she's reconstructing this papyrus. Also, I'm working with her. I was I was able to reconstruct this structure. This is most probably a bark station. The bark station, which is mentioned uh, in other uh, <clears throat> Greek and Demotic sources, and which should be located somewhere in the northern part of Patiris. And this may be the bark station, which I mentioned when I was showing the drawing representing the view of the eastern mountain of Gebelein uh, during uh, Pharaonic times. Of course, there's plenty of work to do with the town. Also, Lena Tams is cons working on the subject. She is studying the local uh, population and the relation uh, between among the people. Aneta is dealing with the papyrological evidence to reconstruct the topography. So maybe all together we'll be able to reconstruct the uh, the life of the ordinary provincial town in southern Egypt during Ptolemaic uh, times. And this is actually the end of my talk. Uh, there is plenty more to say, uh, but I'm already you know, speaking for too long. At the end, I really would like to thank 
the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities for providing us with the opportunity to conduct to conduct the service there and to make conservation works. Also, I cannot express my gratitude enough to the inspectors and our workers and the local uh, Taftish and the director and managers of the antiquities of the area who were really very helpful. Also, Dr. Zbigniew Szafrański, Dr. Artur Obuski were very helpful uh, with our work. There was a great support from the Polish Center of the Mediterranean Archaeology, uh, uh, which also financially supported the project together with the University of Warsaw Foundation, the Board of PhD students and other uh, bodies within the University of Warsaw who are very generous. And last but not least, members of the project were present during most of the seasons uh, and were very much help, very helpful. They devoted their hard work time uh, and I really cannot express my gratitude. Thank you guys very much. And of course, thank you. I would like to thank three other institutions which resources I'm frequently using during my talks and my papers. Museo Egizio, who uh, provided me with an access to uh, its collection, uh, the Egyptian Museum, which is super helpful uh, when uh, I was doing my uh, archival surveys, uh, especially related to uh, the uh, objects in its magazines and the British Museum has also a nice collection of artifacts coming from Gebelein. Thank you very much uh, for your attention.